So, good afternoon to all of you. A very warm welcome to this webinar on discounting, which we have given the title Price of Time Discounting and Financial Reporting. The webinar is jointly organized uh, by the European Accounting Association, the Scottish Institute, ICAS, and EFRAC. So, my name is Saskia Slomp, and I'm working here at EFRAC. Uh, we are very impressed because we have over 500 reg registrants, so discounting seems to be a hot topic. And this we also saw in our preparatory meetings uh, with the speakers and the panelists. So we are really looking forward to a lively debate. Um, before I'm going to hand over to Guy Job, some of um, admin points for you. Um, this meeting is recorded and can be watched and listened back after the webinar if you're interested. Um, the program, the slides and the bios of the speakers are on our website. Um, there was a link in the email, but also if you go uh, to, the, to the bottom, you see event resources. If you click there, you find all these uh, things, the program, the slides and the bios. Well, you have seen we have a very eminent group of speakers and we encourage you to ask questions. So there is a box on your screen where you can type your questions. You have seen that uh, we have three academic presentations and afterwards there is a Q&A session after each presentation, so please put in, type in your questions and there will be answers or some of them will be answered. We also have polling questions and they should have appeared on your screen already, the first one. And we asked you as well to um, answer these so that we can see what you think as an audience. Um, I don't know, do we have already the results of the first polling question? Not really? Okay. We'll come back to that a, a bit later then to see who we are and who we have here in the audience. Uh, Guy, I'm going to hand over to you. So uh, Guy is the chair of the ICAS research panel and he is the vice chair of the European Governance Institute. Guy, over to you. Saskia, thank you for your kind uh, introduction and for inviting me to say a few words. Uh, Thank you also to everyone for taking the time out to join us today for what I hope you will find an informative and engaging event. Fifty years ago, when I was embarking on my accountancy training, my views and opinions on discounting would have been written on the back of a postage stamp. The subject seemed theoretical, complex, and frankly, somewhat irrelevant. But how things have changed. Discounting is now embedded in the mainstream of accounting standards and their application. Furthermore, in a world where the implications of climate change are justifiably pervasive, the materiality and relevance of discounting is undeniable. It can have significant social and economic impact. Therefore, in a world where responsible capitalism has come to the fore, discounting merits much greater attention than it did 50 or even five years ago, and not least by policymakers, preparers, and users. Now today, as Saskia mentioned, we shall hear about three research projects. First, the theory and practice of discounting in financial reporting under IFRS. And this will be presented by Professor Ian Clatcher of the Leeds University Business School. Second, how practitioners depart the IFRS maze towards the end of determinism in accounting which will be presented by Professor Veronica Bloom from the Université Grenoble Alps. And last but not least, Professor Giovanna Michelon from the University of Bristol will present her research on discounting and disclosure practices of decommissioning liabilities, which is an issue that the FRC in the UK and other regulators are now focusing on. Two of these pro projects were funded by ICAS, one of which was jointly with FRAG, and the third 
One was commissioned by ANC, the French regulator. We collectively selected them for today's event as we view their individual scopes as complementary, covering many aspects of what may be perceived as the issues with discounting in financial reporting. At the conclusion of the three presentations, Erlen Carval will moderate a distinguished and diverse panel to discuss their views on some of the key issues. So, without further ado, I should now like to hand over to Ian Clatcher for our first presentation. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you everybody for joining today. And I think the first thing I do in my presentation is I issue disclaimers. So anything I say is not the view of ICAS, EFRAG, Allen, Mark, Con, or the University of Leeds. So it's all on me. So if I say anything which is controversial, um, nobody else is to blame but me, but we'll try and keep it um, within the confines of interesting rather than challenging. So I think one thing to point out about the research team is we're a mixed bunch. So Mark previously worked in industry and investment. Alan was previously an auditor. Uh, Con has had a very long and varied career in financial services, cutting across asset management, insurance, pensions, and a whole host of other areas. And I have a sort of multifaceted career in as much as I spend quite a lot of time in the real world as, in, as well as in academia. So I think it gives us an interesting perspective on the world. So can we move to the next slide, please? So very briefly, to give you an idea of what's coming up, I'm going to give you an overview of the project, a brief history of discounting, and that's not discounting within the context of financial accounting, but where did discounting as a process come from? Because one of the things I find missing in a lot of discussions, not just in accounting, but in other areas, for example, actuarial science, is there is no long-lived history as to the processes to how we arrived to today. So I think looking at that is instructive, and it helps us start to think about how we could maybe improve on things and do things better. I'll give you some brief key findings of the work we did and some of the conclusions that we've arrived at. So next slide, please. So in terms of the project, uh, we looked at a range of standards. So we looked at IFRS 4, IFRS 17, IES 19. Um, and we did an in-depth literature review, not just in terms of accounting research, but also other disciplines, so finance, economics, actuarial science, areas where we know that discount rates feature quite heavily. We looked at a number of standards and we compared the basis for conclusions and seen whether there were consistencies, inconsistencies, differences in approach and so on. We also interviewed experts on the application and use of discount rates in practice across these key standards. And I think that's very important as well because from an academic perspective to even a regulatory perspective to what actually is done in practice, these things can differ quite substantially. And we also did a survey that looked at IES 19 specifically to try and generate some data. And I think we were right to pick IES 19 as the standard because we actually got quite an interesting response rate. Discount rates often to me seem like kind of obscure and sort of niche pastime and hobby. And I think the survey suggests that that's not the case. And similarly, I think the, the research that we're seeing presented today suggests that while that was the case previously, the emphasis and importance of this area uh, is growing. And I think that's important to note. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the very brief history of discounting was actually this starts out in economics, which is probably not surprising. And it was actually Adam Smith and another Scottish economist called John Ray who were thinking about the economics and psychology of intertemporal choice. And this is really about if we have 
a, a pool of resources today within the, an economy, how do we consume them and allocate them through time? Because if we consume less today, we might be able to consume more tomorrow. Or similarly, if we're consuming lots today, are we essentially implying that less will be consumed tomorrow? So these start to get into really quite significant and um, important questions in terms of how we organise society. Now, this debate continued, and it was really formalised by Paul Samuelson in a discounted utility model in 1937. And... What that really is, is your standard sort of present value. What's the present value of a stream of cash flows that are accruing to us? And what is the stream of present, present value of cash flows that may, we may well be paying out in the future, and not just the near future, but into the far future? And the central assumption of this is that all of the risk, uncertainty, and disparate motives that build into intertemporal choice are reduced down to one single parameter, which is the discount rate. So that number does a lot of heavy lifting, and that doesn't matter whether it's in economics, actuarial science, whatever, that number has a lot in it. Next slide, please. So the model was accepted very quickly, and it was accepted very quickly because it was very readily identifiable to how we would think about calculating future values with compounding. And so it had an intuitive appeal. However, Samuelson himself was concerned that the model didn't actually represent the world properly. So it has assumptions about behaviour in it that actually may not reflect the world. And from what we see in research, so for example, within decision sciences, that may well not be the case. So for example, hyperbolic discounting, that's a non-rational form of discounting. And so the kind of discounting that we would see out of the Samuelson model is not necessarily aligning up to what we would see in the real world, and that's problematic. That's a major source of research and debate in economics, for example, but I think there's comparatively little about discount rates in academic accounting. And I think that's also important. Next slide, please. So when we look at the key findings, when we did across standard comparisons, and probably unsurprisingly, we found that standards are often inconsistent. And so a particular standard looks at a particular issue and has a framework for discounting in it. Now, we do, we've not got the time to go into all the differences, but I think, again, some of the arguments and the basis for conclusion can be questioned. One case being IES 19, where the conclusions state that future interest rates are predicted by forward rates. And we know that that's not true. So the expectations of the market in the current period, as reflected in the term structure of interest rates, do not forecast the prevailing interest, the rate of interest in subsequent periods. So there you've got an underlying assumption about how interest rates work from today into the future within the basis of conclusion for IES 19. But actually, we know empirically that that's not the case. So that then suggests that there is something else that has to be thought about with regards to that standard. What is it that that standard is trying to achieve if there is a disjoint between what we know about economics and what the standard is actually doing? We've also seen through time improvements in discounting approaches as standards have evolved, and a good example of that is leasing. Uh, next slide, please. So from the interviews, there was a general agreement of the numbers being presented in financial statements are often not related to what actually dictates corporate action. So again, thinking about pensions, we have IES 19 that sets out how we should value the liability of a pension with regards to a, a, a double A bond of sufficient maturity, whereas actually the reality of the underlying economics of what governs a pension scheme is dictated in the UK, for example, by the pensions regulator, and they do not use a double-A bond rate. There was also an acknowledgement of sensitivity to reported values and the, the sort of small changes to the discount rate can have a large impact to what is presented in financial statements. And the response to this is quite different. So what we have seen in pensions 
is a move to matching assets. So we've seen pension funds move towards holding more AA bonds and government bonds because it lowers the balance sheet volatility because you get a natural offset between the discount rate and the assets in the pension scheme. Whereas we interviewed somebody about decommissioning and what they said was we don't respond to transitory changes, we explain them. So we have a model that explains our approach to decommissioning costs. And as that changes and iterates through time, we spend a lot of time in narrative disclosures rather than going back and changing the underlying model. Another thing that was quite instructive was the fact that economic consequences were not largely featured in part of the discussions. So thinking about how um, accounting numbers shape reality and potentially influence behaviour was largely restricted to shareholders and other investors. And the idea of economic consequences extending beyond that group really didn't feature. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of our key findings for our survey, we got 101 responses. And interestingly for me, the, the highest proportion of responses came from Germany, um, with the Netherlands and UK being the next most common respondents. Now, there's a lot of analysis in there, but I think the, the important finding is, despite the, 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 the standard setting, the benchmark for the discount rate being a high-grade corporate bond, of sufficient maturity and things like that. There was a large variation across countries, which is to be expected because a high-grade corporate bond in Germany will differ from a high-grade corporate bond that's appropriate for the Netherlands or Europe. But within countries, there was a significant variation. And so we were seeing about a 1% variation between the high and low estimates that people were given. And that has quite significant impacts on what the, the actual stated liability would be in the accounts. 100 bips is huge. Uh, next slide, please. Another part of this survey is we asked some questions around the conceptual framework. And we asked the respondents to say what part of the conceptual framework was most important. So one being the most important, six being the least important. And what we have presented here is the averages of those responses. And so what we see is faithful representation is by far and by far and above the most important part of the conceptual framework for the people that we um, uh, surveyed. And timeliness was the least. But I think this is quite important to look at this because I think when you think you cannot achieve all of these things. I think that's the point. You cannot have all of these things being equally important and you cannot achieve them all uh, through a set of accounts. And so when you then look for me, when you then look at this faithful representation, relevance, comparability and understandability are clearly the most important with verifiability and timeliness coming further, further back. So next slide, please. So the conclusions, I think there needs to be a significantly higher amount of work done by academics that engages with issues of discounting. And I think we're seeing some of that happening today. And I think going forward, it becomes fundamentally more important. One of my concerns is that discount rates and approaches to um, discounting are imported from other disciplines. So, for example, um, you, you, we quite often see cap, the capital asset pricing model. So, something that was developed in empirical finance is used in certain parts for how we'd maybe think about estimating the weighted average cost of capital. But there is an implicit assumption there that um, the capital asset pricing model is correct, and it is not without a significant amount of debate and controversy in other fields. So that that's wholesale importation, I think, is problematic. I think the other thing we then have to look at is assumptions around what markets are telling us. So markets are assumed to be efficient. And if market efficient are efficient and the pricing of securities in that setting is giving us a true signal, then that matters. However, the debates about the efficiency of markets are manifest 
And again, if those debates are happening elsewhere, then I think they're highly relevant in a setting where we're using market-derived discount rates and market prices. Because if there is something fundamentally challenged somewhere else and it's not reflected in how we think about accounting, then I think that's something that needs much more thought within the accounting community, in particular from the academics. The second point is there was an IFRS standards project looking at discount rates in February 2019, and it more or less said that discount rates, we acknowledge there are some differences in bits of variability, but that uh, it's, it's not going to be investigated further. However, the third agenda consultation that came out in March 2021 has discount rates on the list, and it also has employee benefits on the list. So these things that were off the table previously actually may well be on the table going forward, and I am of the opinion that these should be very high up the agenda of the IESB. And the final thing is, I think that from all the discussions we've had in the run-up to this event, uh, and also um, from the interviews that we did, a principles less best practice guide to help preparers, preparers clearly understand the objective of standards, and this being set in the context and the importance placed on faithful representation would be extremely valuable and would be a huge step towards enabling the, the objectives of the standards to be met. And that's me for now. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. So um, I encourage uh, all the people that are online, and we have seen there are a lot of preparers and a lot of academics from the results, uh, to put in your questions, type them in, in that box on your screen. Uh, and I'm handing over to Rasmus because there are a few questions for Ian to, to answer. Rasmus, can you introduce yes, the I questions? Can. Yes, uh, we have the, the first question, and that is uh, whether you, while, while, while you did your, your research on, dic uh, on, on discounting, uh, came across any principle that could work to resolve uh, current issues uh, in discounting, and that is a, a building block approach that, that can capture some of the uncertainty that uh, can incorporate inherent element of, of variation resulting from a estimation process. I don't know if, if if you came across yeah uh, uh, these uh, and any solutions to how to to block these uh, uh, estimation uh, issues uh, during your research. So I think where that's possible is if you go back and look at what is being valued, because there are certain things which are set out in contract. So, for example, um, the terms of a pension are set out in an employment contract, so we know how much is going in. We know then what the benefits being targeted are, and actually there is an implicit rate of return on that. And I think you see that in that, that kind of approach in looking at the legal form of the, the liability um, being set out in something like leasing. And so I think that is a a very important differentiator from something where it's much more uncertain and um, there's a much higher degree of judgment required. So, for example, decommissioning. And I think that I think that principles approach and separating issues out where there are clearly terms that are being set in a legally binding framework versus things where there is we know there is a, an, un, an uncertain cost and differentiate, differentiating and separating the approaches to them, I think would be a good start. Thanks, Ian. Um, Rasmus, there is a further question, I think, about uh, national differences. Is that something you there want is to There is also, yeah we, have also yeah, we have a question on, uh, do you think that national differences can be overcome in the choice of discount rates? Uh, and uh, are the different, or that relates to different national approaches to conservatism. Are the different national approaches to conservatism? So I'm actually a fan of variation. So I actually think that the comparability issue um, it doesn't really rate as highly for me. I'm very interested in what is it this information is telling me about the, the, the specific company I'm looking at. And so cross-company variation, I, I need it to be de decision useful for me as an investor. So I need to spend the time to dig into the accounts to understand what is going on in that company. And if I was to be then going across to other companies, I need to analyse that company in detail again. 
And then further out from that is if I was going to be looking at investing in com companies in, say, Germany, I would have to understand that institutional context. So I actually, I don't think you can arrive in a system that is going to allow you to answer um, any given question. So, for example, how well funded is a pension scheme um, based upon an accounting standard that cuts across so many jurisdictions? So I think it's, it's, I think we need a much more nuanced approach to this. I don't think standardisation gets us to where we want to be. Okay, thank you. Um, Rasmus, one last short question and a short answer, and then we move on to the next uh, presentation of Veronique Blum. Uh, the, the next, yeah, I think that is a, a quite a short question and perhaps also a short answer. It is asked uh, what the right discount rate is depends on, on what is should be the answer. So what a question is expected to answer. And, and the question is, are we not trying to design the fifth floor of a building where it's, it's ground floor has still to, to, to be agreed? Uh, what is it that we are trying to achieve with, with, with discount rates? Uh, is, should that not be the, the first question to answer? Okay. Ian, short answer, because you have 45 seconds. Uh, I think the answer to that is maybe, and I think this is going to be a feature of the panel discussion anyway, so we'll leave it for there where we can get into it in a bit more detail. Great. So, I'm going to hand over now to Véronique, who is going to present um, her study um, that she did with Pierre Terron on discount rate in accounting, how protections depart the IFRS maze towards the end of determinism in accounting. In a Véronique. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Saskia, and uh, thanks uh, to all the audience for being uh, so uh, numerous uh, today. I'm very happy to present uh, the results of our research. It was conducted by uh, myself from the University of Grenoble-Alpes, and Pierre Théron was with us today and uh, will be among the panelists later. Uh, Pierre studies in the, well, Pierre teaches in the uh, Institute for Financial Sciences and Actuarian Studies, but is also a professional in the matter. So our study was about discount rate in accounting, and we are questioning uh, the uh, end of determinism into valuation model as a result of uh, this study. So we can move to the next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. So we know that uh, ISB and uh, probably the audience knows that ISB has conducted a project on the discount rates. We're going to throw some elements of that research in this presentation of today. Uh, this research was closed. Still, we thought and IFRAC thought that there was some more discussion uh, to uh, conduct uh, on the topics. We're trying to add here some insights that were not uh, precise or were not mentioned in this research. So can we move to the next slide? Yes, next slide, please. So our research was um, divided in four main parts. The first part, uh, similar to IAM, uh, we went back to the origin of the discount rate, but also to the origin of the uh, interest rate as an element of society construction, just as IAM has now mentioned. The second part was about reading the discount rates in IS and IFRS in order to collect all possible definitions that were available in the standards. Our third part focused on a literature review, but this was specially um, dedicated to the effects of this count rate. And then we also conducted some interviews, and those interviews were focused on how practitioners were implementing this count rate into their own valuation issues. Next slide, please. So here's an excerpt of uh, what we found when reading uh, the standard. There were uh, many definitions of discount rates. Um, I will now focus on IS 36, for example, where we have the idea of time value of money, the idea of specific risk that should be uh, embedded in the discount rates, um, the exclusion of risks that are not relevant. And then to estimate this discount rate, it is recommended both to, well, um, many recommendations, in fact, uh, are present in IS 36. 
the entity you work uh, with the use of the CAPM, um, the entities incremental borrowing rate could be a substitute. There's also the idea of a surrogate above the market borrowing rate. And then there is also the paradoxical idea that this contract is independent to the entity capital structure. So all of this has uh, made the ISP uh, point to some issues that we are now going to discover on the next slide. So can you click once? Yes. So uh, uh, some points that were raised by the ISB in the research project that we just mentioned was uh, the presence of multiple definitions and measures of uh, the discount rate, the significant impact of discount rate, especially uh, when unwinding or rate variation were concerned, the dual role or sometimes single role of discounting, which which is both the capture of the time value and the risk values. Then we went further, we listed the issues that were raised by our interviewers. Those were mainly practical. So uh, people that we interviewed uh, were mainly um, exercising in small, medium-sized companies. Those had issues with respect to how to apply discount rates, for example, in, a, in an impairment uh, context. Should we use entity discount rate or the group discount rate was one of their questions. Then there was some observation or, in fact, declaration about the fact that uh, the published discount rate were not the one that they were using because those ones were embedding uh, too much information or were too numerous to be. Uh, disclosed. Then there were a common and recurrent concern ab about uh, the uh, perpetual rent, because this one, uh, when practicing DCF method and a long-term long valuation, weights a lot in the total value, and many people were concerned with that ID. And then, as I had mentioned before, so uh, I'm not going to be too long on that, uh, quite uh, always, uh, there were some concern with pra with practices with applying uh, the cap and the, the capital assets pricing model. Uh, main questions were related to how do we define the hypothesis? Where do we find the risk free rate? Where do we how do we compute the market premium? Uh, what is the data periodicity that we should be using? Weekly, monthly, daily data? Uh, what is the index of reference that we should be using? Uh, how far uh, behind should we be looking when estimating a beta one year, two years, five years? What is a good sample? What are the sources what we should be using, especially if they could be uh, cheap of access or easy of access would have been interesting for some of our interviewees. And then last but not least, uh, there was a little faith in the relevancy of the model, and that was an issue for all our interviewees. So we can move to next slide. So in fact, uh, what, come, what came out of our interviews was the idea that discount rate is more a, um, an issue in a representing risk. And Badi, Barth, Duro, and Norma Zabel have produced uh, two years ago a study that was already addressing uh, this ID. They said that value estimates are fraud with estimation error and bias. Why is that? This is because we're using deterministic values. We use one NPV curve, for example. So one of those curves that we are seeing on the bottom left of uh, your screen um, is only used for making a valuation, where if we're looking forward, uh, there are multiple possibilities so what we're trying to um, uh, represent with one dot, one value, one punctual estimation is in fact the distribution uh, that is here uh, on, uh, I'm still on the left side uh, of uh, your slide. So the solution that was uh, proposed by Badia and Al uh, was to um, disclose the centiles or quintiles uh, associated to uh, the uh, distribution. They were, they were proposing that uh, giving the probability that we are 10% above uh, one measure, well, well, 
uh, the, the 10th centile and the mean uh, or the median uh, could help people to rebuild those distributions. So uh, I think we thought uh, with Pierre that this was an excellent idea that we focus on how we should represent um, distribution of potential values and what could be uh, the parameters that help users to rebuild the same distributions that the issuers have in mind when they are producing data. Um, why are distributions relevant? Look at what um, is going on in IFRS 13. In IFRS 13, uh, we equate uh, the idea that adjusting by the cash flows or adjusting by the discount rate is similar. Uh, now, this is a case study from a biotech, which is uh, listed on the Euronext growth. So this company um, has uh, um, decided to use IFRSs on a voluntary basis. When uh, we run a Monte Carlo simulation, which is the way we can uh, build the distribution of future potential values, uh, we have the above figure, uh, figure on the uh, right hand uh, of your slide. And you may not see it properly, but I'm going to describe it. The ranges of possible va values is between 0 and 180. If we adjust by the flow, we see that we narrow uh, this range down to something between 30 and a bit more than 120. So uh, we have, not only do we have a symmetrical distribution on one hand and more symmetrical distribution on the other hand, but we also are able to narrow uh, the, those distributions when we have available statistics uh, to estimate our transition risks. Um, this is how we can adjust cash flows, of course. So let's move to the last slides where we produced some recommendation, and those are uh, available in our reports, and they are described in detail in our report. So our first recommendation uh, is the following. IFRS could provide more insights on disposition, objective, and concepts whenever related to whenever there is something relating to uh, discounting rates. Our second recommendation is about about the vocabulary. I will come back to that in a minute. Our third recommendation is about identifying and, year, and providing a hierarchy of information sources that would be available or that would be reliable, in fact, uh, for the users and uh, the issuers, I mean, when I say those users of discount rates. Uh, Recommendation four is about concerns of financial liabilities and financial assets. We really want to point to the fact that what is financial and what is non-financial could be treated differently. So uh, ISP should allow term structure of interest rate, provided that issuers name their information sources. Then the concept of cost of equity and cost of capital should be clarified. So this is a vocabulary issue also. So this is a this this was our fifth recommendation. Our sixth recommendation is about, it's close to uh, number seven, so I'm going to address the two at the same time. So risk could be better captured in the cash flows, avoiding additive and subjective rate whenever it is possible. And to do so, we propose to project all potential uncertainties in the cash flows and in the variations of those cash flows in a non-deterministic manner. And that was illustrated by the Monte Carlo simulation, which is so. And finally, Recommendation number eight is about using prospective evaluation and, gu and having guidance on this. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Veronique. Uh, that was very enlightening. We also have a few questions for you, which uh, Rasmus will introduce. But I realize I forgot to introduce Rasmus properly. So Rasmus Sommer is my colleague, and he is in charge of research in, uh, in FRAC, and he is also... Uh, supporting the academic panel. So, Rasmus, are there questions for Veronique? Yes, we are receiving some questions for, for Veronique. Uh, the first question is, uh, what would uh, be uh, the recommendation uh, in relation to the dual role of discounting, both uh, in relation to time value and in, in relation to risk? And I think the person asking this question has uh, perhaps a, an answer asking about stochastic <laughs> modeling in a, a risk-neutral environment. Could that be the solution? 
Uh, well, um, I don't know if we can project a risk-neutral environment, whereas the true environment of uh, the issuer would not be a risk-neutral. So uh, we still have to uh, stick to uh, the reality of the issuer. Uh, our concern with this dual aspect of time value and risk capture uh, in this country is more about acknowledging uh, about the acknowledgement of uh, what is really capture in the discount rates when discount rates are used. So this could be uh, done through disclosures or uh, some uh, um, yeah, commenting information uh, when one specific discount rate is used. So yes, stochastic modeling is in interesting, and uh, we, we just uh, I just pointed to that uh, in my presentation but not in a risk neutral. I would think that we really want to um, capture exogenous as well as endogenous risks whenever we're doing that stock acid modeling. Okay, Rasmus, further question? Yeah, we have uh, quite some some questions. I'm, I'm not sure we, we will have time for all of them, but we can try some more. Okay. Uh, a question, uh, perhaps quite simple, is how, how do you consider the work done by the International Valuation Standards Council in terms of providing standards to help value or to bring consistency in, in fair value? And did you consider uh, this in, in in your in your research? Yes, well, IVSC is using or is recommending uh, the uh, usually uh, to, to conduct a valuation. IVSC is recommending the four main approaches that are already present in IFRS 13. Uh, IVSC is also looking for more, um, uh, let's say, for other. Uh, valuation methods that would capture uh, this, uh, those distributions of value, of forward-looking values that I'm mentioning. I saw that there were some efforts uh, to um, integrate real option thinking in IVSC, but this is not developed uh, in detail so far. So uh, uh, those are uh, paths um, likely to follow. In fact, uh, real, options, real option methodology, for example, or rather real option thinking than real option valuation is the way to construct distribution uh, provided that uh, we manipulate them uh, with care. So yes, it's well, what is going on, what, if, if I can uh, um, summarize this, what, what is going on in IFRS is already uh, consistent with what uh, IVSC uh, is uh, uh, recommending. And I think on both sides, uh, we can move a little bit further into or away uh, into uh, the representation of risks. Okay, thank you, Veronique. Yes. Uh, but I think we can take uh, one or two more. Okay. Well, we can take the, the, the two, two together. Then uh, the first question is, how would you propose the small and medium-sized businesses would apply Monte Carlo approach to risking uh, future cash flows in a quick and efficient way? Uh, it sounds quite an onerous exercise. And another question, how do uh, educate, uh, how to educate preparers that adjusting for risk in the discount rate means reducing the discount rate for a higher, li for a higher liability to cover more possibilities and not a higher discount rate like <coughs> assets. It may even be a negative rate. Okay. Well, there are two questions here, and I cannot read the questions, so if you can okay, put, will, put them in the chat, yes, yes, I so will. I can uh, see the second again. Uh, the first one was to help SMEs. Well, there are very uh, easy ways right now to conduct basic uh, pro projection uh, with, mon with multiple scenarios. You just need an Excel add-in to do that, so there's nothing. Um, it's basic algebra a little bit improved, so um, I think that the education on that side is not a big deal. I think it's really easy to integrate in the management education that already exists and in uh, chartered accountant uh, education also uh, uh, can very easily integrate that. It's already present in France, for example. We do some Monte Carlo simulation. At least we have some um, one chapter in the finance class uh, for our chartered accountant that opens 
uh, to uh, those uh, concepts and to uh, those uh, forward-looking valuations. So um, I never thought it was hard to address uh, to our students, and they are very receptive. So um, um, I don't think it's an it's a big issue, but we have to share it on. Uh, probably uh, to a wider scope of people, of course, of uh, issuers. And there was a second question, uh, which was reducing the discount rate. Well, adjusting the discount rate is not necessarily about reducing the discount rate. Most of the practices, when they, uh, most of the practice practitioner now, when they want to add, uh, um, when when they want to capture more risks in their model, they add some premium to the discount rate. So right now the practice is more about adding rather than reducing. If you have a discount rate that already includes a, a risk premium, if you already have done that work, then uh, when going the other way, when uh, introducing more risk capture in the cash flows, that would mean reducing the discount rates. Yes, probably. So I think that this question is about that, although I'm not completely sure about this. Uh, but there's also the question about the liabilities, and I think that the panelists are going to discuss this. Um, many people think that environmental liability of course, should uh, be using negative rates because this is what we owe to uh, the future generation. And I think that I'm not going to close that debate. There's a lot of arguments to bring into uh, this uh, low rate, negative rates debate, and some part of it will be discussed uh, today uh, later with the panelists. Okay. Thank you, Veronique. With these observations, I think we are going to pass on to Giovanna, who is going to present the study that she did together with Marie on uh, black box accounting, discounting and disclosure practices of decommissioning liabilities. Giovanna. Thank you, Saskia. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a great pleasure to present this research, which was generously funded by ICAS. ICAS also oversaw the peer review process, and we are really thankful to the ICAS research panel because they uh, gave us very valuable comments and suggestions as we were developing it. Besides Marie, the research project is also uh, co-authored with Thomas Schneider from the University, Ryerson University. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I would like to start with giving a bit of context about the commission liabilities, which also kind of um, make the, the motivation for, for our study. When a company acquires certain types of long-term assets, such as an oil ring or a nuclear power plant, it incurs an inherent obligation to remove the asset and clean up and restore the site once the asset has reached the end of its useful life. So the commissioning commitments require estimating the future cash outflows associated, associated with the commissioning the asset and cleaning up or restoring the site, as well as obviously choosing a discount rate for calculating the present value of these cash outflows. What is perhaps perhaps more special about this type of liabilities is that they do not really disappear if the firm goes into insolvency, but they remain associated with the asset and impair any future cash flow uh, for creditors or future owners. This can in turn make the asset less attractive to a potential buyer, and if eventually the asset remains unsold, the public ends up picking up the decommissioning costs. So accounting for the commission liabilities, um, I would say has a lot of public interest that perhaps matters more than for other type of liabilities. So these decommissioning liabilities are really physical liabilities and any monetary amount attached to them is really a proxy. Um, so no matter how big or small the firms are, um, the, the, the commissioning liabilities are implicitly owned by a society, which ultimately may sustain the decommissioning cost or suffer the potential negative environmental impact. Now, IS-37 mandates that the future costs of cleanup and decommissioning um, is um, estimated and accounted for using appropriate discount rate. Um, and uh, however, the standard does not mandate 
that firms disclose the rate that they have used. Nor it really makes clear whether the basis for calculating the discount rate should be an accounting choice by design or practice. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the project had three broad aims, which really correspond to three research questions that we had in the study. Uh, the first one is about whether there is diversity in the choice of the discount rate in accounting for the commission liabilities, and if so, what are the determinants of, of this choice? The second um, aim um, essentially looks at identifying disclosure practices when it comes to accounting for the commission in liabilities, and which one can be considered uh, more informative or best practices. And the third is essentially to contribute to a wider discussion about um, the theoretical basis and objectives in the application of the discount rate, given the social impact that the commission and liability may have. Next slide, please. So I don't really have much time, but I only want to briefly mention that we reviewed three stream of literature to inform our study. The first stream looks at the use of discount rates in accounting practice, which we have heard a lot about. The second literature stream analyzed disclosure practices related to this kind of obligation. And generally they suggest that there is um, disclosure, diversity in disclosure, and this is related to firm specific factor, but also uh, by some sort of uh, tight uh, or allows regulatory um, enforcement and, and, and environments. Um, for the theoretical discussion about which discounts rates to apply to the commission liabilities uh, that are characterized by often very long horizons and high level of uncertainty, uh, we refer to the environmental economics literature, uh, which with different nuances seem to suggest the use of lower discount rates or discounting at a rate that declines as the time horizon of the liability lengthens. Next slide, please. So we use a multi-method approach that combines an archival collection of disclosure practices and then a set of interviews with the stakeholder. Uh, we, we adopted a multi-method approach to allow a far-reaching overview and assessment of the problem, but also kind of uh, use the interviews especially to formulate our guidance um, about the implica implications of our findings. The archival study is based on a wide sample of publicly traded companies in three sectors, the oil and gas, the mining and the utilities over a period of 12 years from 2005 to 2016. Um, the data is essentially um, manually collected from the annual reports um, with the help of some textual analysis. We searched more than 10,000 reports and I would say roughly half of them in the oil and gas and mining sector do have known no uh, the commission liabilities and only about 22% in the utility se uh, um, sector. Uh, we also conducted some, some interviews, 27, um, to complement the findings that we obtained from the archiv archival research. Um, and we uh, tried our best to cover a cross session of stakeholders that included preparers, auditors, regulators, uh, civil society, users, experts, to get a broad view about the information needs of different um, users and stakeholders, but also to understand what were the challenges when it comes to accounting for decommissioning and liabilities. Next slide, please. So um, the key findings from the archival uh, analysis are uh, listed here. If you need more details, please consult our report. But essentially, the archival uh, collection of data and analysis documents significant diversity in practice above, um, across both industry and, and sectors and countries. Uh, about 50% of the oil and gas and mining companies uh, disclose the discount rate, and only 30% in the utility um, sector. Oil and gas and mining are more likely to adjust the discount rate by some sort of risk factor that is not always necessarily specified. The mining sector tends to use a wider range of discount rates, and generally speaking, they have higher rates than the oil and gas and utility sectors. Firms that are um, domiciliated in Australia, Canada, South Africa, and the UK tend to have more firms that kind of um, uh, report discounts rates in the higher percentiles of, of the distribution. In terms of the determinants of disclosure, um, 
the common driver across sector is the level of enforcement, which is perhaps not surprising, but also um, uh, the, some other country level characteristics, uh, such as, for example, the, the level of environmental regulation, as well as the risk-free rate of, of a certain country. Um, when enforcement is high, companies tend to use um, lower discount rates, but obviously when the, the country level risk-free rate is higher, then they also increase um, increase their rate. A firm-specific driver of transparency and disclosure is uh, the presence of a big four auditor uh, auditing um, the, the reports, especially in the oil and gas and mining industry. Um, and uh, firm size has also an impact on, on the willingness to disclose the discount rates but only in the mining and utility sectors. Uh, Canada uh, is a special case. There is a large number of firms that are exploration based, uh, exploration phase firms. They are small. Um, they are likely to carry relatively few decommission liabilities, but they are also more likely to report the discount rates because this was about, this was some sort of a legacy coming from the, the old Canadian gap that preceded the adoption of IFRS in 2011. Next slide, please. So in terms of some, um, we also analyzed some examples of disclosure to identify different levels that firms would use. Um, some are very succinct and perhaps a bit opaque, whereas others indicate specifically which assets will be decommissioning and in which year. Uh, they uh, mention the discount rate for each field. They include sensitivity analysis to illustrate the impact of a change um, in the discount rate. And finally, others provide very detailed discussion of the uncertainties surrounding the estimation of this, um, of this um, liability. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the interview findings, generally speaking, they kind of um, supported uh, or were aligned with the archival analysis. Um, the wide range of discount rates seen in, in the previous data are reflected also in the comments of a number of practitioners. Uh, what come what comes across clearly in the interviews um, is that auditors, regulators, standard setters consider uh, that the firm have the choice to either use a risk-free rate or a risk-adjusted rate when they discount uh, the commission liabilities. Uh, and so the first quote that you see there, so we view it as an essential accounting policy. So most, I should say all, but most of our really big clients factor their own credit risk in the provision, which means that the some firms uh, in their considering of risk, adjust uh, when adjusting for risk, consider their, their own credit risk in the discount rate. The last quote shows that the discount rate is a firm policy choice that allow for very different balance sheet amounts to be recognized um, for similar liabilities, which uh, which is an issue for uh, one of the users that we interviewed. Next slide, please. So the standard does not state that the discount rate or the undiscounted amount of the provision must be disclosed. The predominant view of our interviewees uh, was that without these two disclosures, the reported liability is quite a black box. Um, with these two numbers, although disclosure will still be an handful um, in perhaps uh, determining the accuracy of the undiscounting uh, the commission liability, at least would give the user a sense of how far uh, out the obligation is and the company ultimate estimate. Um, this is reflected in one of the quotes that you see there. As discussed before, therefore, um, uh, the, the Canadian companies seem to be um, behaving slightly different from the rest of the sample that we analyzed. And as I said, this is part of the legacy of the country. Uh, the last two quotes highlight that many of the interviewees would like to see more about the basic assumption that the firm use. So the timing of, of the decommission liabilities, um, and, and these are uh, expressed by a user and, and an auditor as well. Next slide, please. Um, a number of issues uh, come into play with regard conceptual aspects of the discounting of these type of provisions. Are the commissioning liabilities similar to financial liabilities? Are they fair value estimates? What is the appropriate benchmark? And in a sense, all the interviewees agreed that 
the commission liabilities are somewhat different from financial liabilities and that the general public is ultimate owner of the liability in the event that no cleanup or restoration occurs. In some jurisdiction, jurisdiction a seller may see that the commission liability come back if a buyer defaults on them, which is something that also differentiates them from financial liability, and that's uh, represented uh, in, in the first in the first quote there. Uh, not all of the interviews is were convinced that this argument linked the, the, the commission liabilities the, theoretically to a risk-free rate. It was an opinion that was held by a number of interviewees, but others believe that a credit-adjusted rate would, uh, would be proper. Um, as Veronique was mentioning, somebody even dis mentioned and discussed a negative discount rate, which implies really that the present value of the liability today would be greater. Um, and, 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 and generally speaking, um, other interviewees touched upon um, the possibility that discount rate should be below the risk-free rate. So the general conclusion here is that it's simply not possible to give a fair value in this estimate, since there may not be a willing buyer. And if there is no buyer, obviously, uh, there is uh, unlikely to be a feasible fair value. So what is being discounted in IS 37 is an assumption based on the company actually engaging in the cleanup and decommissioning. Next slide, please, and I'm concluding. Um, so, the, the key findings are the disclosure practices vary, the choice of the discount rate is, is important, and this choice requires a, a degree of deliberation. The question concerning whether to use risk-free rate or a just um, discount rate and from what type of uh, risk appears to be an accounting policy choice. Uh, user needs more dis dis more disclosure um, in, in, in terms of what are the discounts rates being used, what are the undiscounted amounts being considering, and the timing of the liabilities. When it comes to which is the appropriate discount rate, it's, it's not clear. Um, there is a consensus, though, that these liabilities differ uh, from financial liabilities, and in a sense, if disclosure of uh, the three uh, points that I just mentioned was was given, then this would allow users to make their own assumption about the present value of the decommissioning liabilities. So we conclude that the key question for standard setters, but I guess also for um, in terms of disclosure for regulator, um, is whether IS 37 was written with the intention that the basis for calculating the discount rate should be an accounting choice, or whether it is acceptable that this has turned out to be the case in practice. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Giovanna. Um, we're going then to Rasmus again to see what questions uh, we have from the audience. Yeah, Rasmus? Yes, and we have received uh, some, some, some questions. And the first question is the, the, the person asked that due to the long term nature of decommissioning liability, uh, these liabilities mostly remain unrecognized uh, as uh, the discounting gave them a very low value and uh, then uh, perhaps you would not consider the amounts material anymore. Uh, also, the, the, the person knows that in certain cases an argument put forward is that the residual value uh, obtained from assets would be sufficient to mitigate any liability that may arise although that uh, the person says that uh, he or she does not personally agree with that, with that argument. But then ask, do you consider that current measurement basis would be the best answer for dealing with such uh, liabilities? Um, well, um, measurement basis, um, I guess there is, there is an argument in environmental economics that um, that uh, there is an issue of fairness and, and, and ethical uh, consideration when it comes to discounting environmental liabilities, because the use of discount rates really shifts the weights uh, on, on, on future generation uh, for the cost of, of decommissioning or, or restoring the assets. Um, 
I, I, I don't know whether current measurement basis would be the best um, answer for dealing with such liabilities. The problem with environmental liabilities, I think, it's also that the estimation of future cash flow is highly uncertain. A lot of these assets have, may have 50 or 100 years uh, time horizons, and a lot of them have never perhaps been even dismissed. So the estimation of the whole amount is really uncertain and, and, and subject to a lot of uncertainty. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, we will not know because the, 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 the person putting the question can, of course, not uh, intervene at this moment. Uh, Rasmus, was, uh, were there other questions for Giovanna? Yes, we have uh, two more questions. Uh, the first uh, is uh, do uh, not uh, uh, regulators generally have the power to uh, require estimates of, of liability that might have to be met uh, from uh, public funds? Uh, yes, um, uh, definitely for some of these um, liabilities, that is the case. Uh, the nuclear uh, industry, for example, is highly regulated and, in fact, um, we did find a lot more disclosures, obviously, because it was driven by the fact that regulators of the nuclear um, industry uh, did demand to have this type of information provided. So once the firms has to provide it to the regulator, I guess the cost of providing it in the financial statement is a lot lower. Um, now, in the problem that we're dealing with is whether investors care about externalities the firm may have on our society or not. It seems to me that there is um, an increasing wave of investors that are interested in considering ESG in their investment decision. And to us, environmental liabilities are uh, perhaps the only externality that is attempted to be accounted for in financial statements. Um, so, um, um, I don't, I, I, as I said, um, I think I would hope investors may be interested in this issue because if it was so, possibly we would see firms disclosing a lot more information. Whether that is the case is, uh, I guess, an empirical question that would be very interesting to, to uh, <laughs> investigate. Okay. Rasmus, uh, last short question and a short answer of Giovanna. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and perhaps it, it, it would be short. I don't know if it, it falls within uh, Kiwana's uh, study, uh, so, so then it will be short. But uh, at, at, at least uh, the, the question is, is there a more nuanced way of modeling long-term growth rates in perpetuity than currently used on the IS-36 impairment testing? Um, well, probably probably there is. Um, um, the, the, the problem is, that it's really hard, I guess, to uh, determine a discount rate with such long, um, um, long-term horizons, right? And as I said, um, the environmental economics literature does suggest that the further away um, is the materialization of this liability, the lower should be the discount rate. Okay, thank you, Giovanna. So this brings us to the end of the presentations of the studies, and we're now going to the panel debate. This panel debate will be moderated by Erland Kvall. Erland is a EFRAC Tech member, and he is the chair of our academic panel, and he is also a member of the European Accounting Association's Financial Reporting Standards Committee. Erland, over to you. Uh, thank you, Saskia. Yes, I have a double role, so... Uh, I was uh, close at hand for choosing me as moderator, but anyway, I thank you for giving me the trust. Um, I shall just repeat shortly for you who are the panel. Uh, we have André Geilen Koten, who is a FRAG Pension Plans Advisory Panel member, and he is employed at Aon. He is an pension expert then. We have Sue Lloyd, from, who is um, vice chair of the ISB. We have Andrea Shenone, who is uh, FAS Commission on Financial Reporting. He's a financial analyst then. And we have Alistair Wilson, who is assurance partner of the EY. So those are the panelists, but also we have agreed that we have three representatives of the research uh, papers that have been presented now, who can also be given the word. 
and that is Pierre Theron, who is at the ISFA actual, actuarial school. He is then co-author with, with Veronique Blum. Blum. We have uh, Jan Klacker that you have already met as a presenter. And we have Mari Pananen, who is at University of Gothenburg, who is the co-author with uh, Giovanna. So uh, these seven people are those that shall answer the different questions. And I have agreed with the panelists in advance which topics we are going to go through and the sequence of those topics. And uh, the panelists, they are uh, can raise their hand or they can signal me uh, in other ways how when you want to speak. And if nobody wants to speak, then I will ask some of you to speak then, nevertheless. Um, and uh, just one last thing before we start the questions. Uh, the, it is that we have a set of polling questions as well. So I will stop uh, when we come to those. Those are for the audience. And uh, uh, so we will take that uh, after, I think, uh, yes, I will tell you when we come to the polling questions. And uh, again, the audience may also send in their questions. So Rasmus, he will read them and he will, he will transfer them to me. So we will see if there is a possibility to also give a, a replies to, to those questions and responses, uh, comments. Okay, but uh, my first question to the panelists then is uh, the, about the, the content of the accounting standards. So we have heard in the documentation and read in the documentation for this, uh, this conference that there is a lot of variation in the requirements of different uh, standards. So my initial question to the panelists is, should there be, um, should accounting standards have a more coherent approach to discounting? I'm not asking precisely whether one should have one single discount rate, but what should one have a more coherent, more consistent system to setting or to uh, for the for the requirement of these contracts in different standards and i think i would challenge sue uh, to start with uh, giving her comments please sue thank you erland so i think the short answer is is yes it would be good to have more coherence in the in the accounting standards um and i think um we ourselves acknowledge that in the in the research that's been referred to a few times, and I'll come back to that. And, but I think the, the difficult thing is we use discounting as a technique in a lot of different settings in our standards associated with a lot of different measurement objectives. So we ask a lot of discount rates, and the discount rate that we need can vary um, between different situations. But I think the thing that one of the things that was identified in the discount rate research that we published in uh, February 2019 that a few people have referred to, it, it highlighted um, sort of recommendations for us to think about ourselves and our future standard setting work, which I think get at this coherence point. The idea that in an ideal world, there'd be a clear measurement objective. So you know what the rate's all about, that there'd be clarity about what inputs should be included and there'd be clarity about what those inputs are meant to represent. And also that there'd be good disclosure to help investors understand what's been happening from a, from a discounting perspective. And I think if you look at some of our newer standards, IFRS 17, the insurance standard is probably the poster child. There's much more specificity and discussion about what the objectives of the measurement are and how to think about the discount rates. And so I think that reflects this um, this, uh, these recommendations. But the report card, if you look back at the older standards, is much more varied. And we, we ourselves noted that in the summary from the discount research, that the older standards tend to be less specific about what inputs should be included and what the inputs mean. And that's exacerbated in a lot of cases by a lack of even a clear measurement basis. So IES 19 doesn't really have a clear measurement basis. IES 37 
is silent on what you do with own credit, which is what's been alluded to in the in the discussion. Um, and so we are doing some work to try and address some of these issues. So, for example, uh, we're doing some narrow scope work on IAS 37, and one of the topics that the board has um, said that we will look at is considering to specify whether or not own credit should should be included in IES 37. So, so we are looking at that. So I think having clear measurement objectives, a clear basis for measurement would facilitate a more coherent approach to um, discounting, because if you've got consistent measurement objectives, prima face, you would expect there to be consistency in how the discount rate is thought about. Now, having said all of that, I'll just finish by saying that that sort of sounds nice and easy, but you only have to probably listen to the panelists today to know that even if we agree on a measurement objective, agreeing then about how the input should be determined and what the appropriate discount rate should be is probably going to have, there'll be differences of opinion. And in all standard setting, there's a difference also between what we might think is conceptually right and what's possible and practical. Um, a couple of people have referred to, you know, the difficulty of identifying discount rates for long-term items. Um, I'll leave it with that. But the short answer is yes, more coherence would be good. Uh, André, you asked for a word. Yes, I um, fully share the vision from uh, Sue. I think uh, uh, the market needs a more coherent approach uh, to these country rates. And it was mentioned uh, also, it was clear from the academic work that uh, we we all listen that uh, there is a bit of inconsistency. However, I have to say this came out uh, from a, uh, an historical period of several years and different uh, purposes and different standards as well. <clears throat> and uh, we have also to admit that the, the new standard, like for example, IFRS 17 for insurance contracts, try to uh, to get this uh, objective. Uh, I think uh, this count rate, however, and I think uh, today it's perfect representation of the interest of uh, of this topic uh, by by just uh, noticing how many people are connected today to, for. For this webinar is is a key measure is a key is a key thing for getting uh, a more making the changes more visible in a timely way and uh, and having a more faithful representations so how how the, the point here is how to use this country it's how how we should better clarify uh, what are uh, our our um, if you want to use a prescript prescriptive or uh, give a prescription to this country rate, having a unique this country rate, or we want to go for, uh, let's say, as as was mentioned before, for better uh, better disclosure. My point of view, and that's very personal. I I would like to leave judgment uh, and freedom, however, in a in a in a framework where uh, where uh, let's say companies needs to um, provide more comprehensive disclosure. I think that's, I uh, was also uh, happy to listen from the, uh, from Professor Michelon, from uh, Mrs. Michelon uh, on her academic work that the comprehensive disclosure is a common, um, is a common request uh, uh, that came out from, from her research. And this, uh, I, I can definitely, I can definitely support uh, this view, despite, uh, let's say, the counter argument that this, is about commercial sensitivity. I think uh, uh, the interest, uh, the public interest, is uh, for uh, having a clear view of what has been chosen, especially in, the, in, the, in a context of a very volatile world, a very volatile context, economic environment that uh, uh, everybody has difficulty to um, to uh, decode. I have André. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, basically um, on, on the question, uh, I, I would agree what uh, Sue said. So yes, there, there should be a, um, a approach to a more, more coherent um, 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 and more uniform um, approach to this, this discounting, and that should be something that is that is principle guided. Uh, so I, I think 
that is um, a good way forward. But I also acknowledge um, that there are issues around um, what is what is possible and what is what is what is practical. Um, I think disclosure is um, also very important um, with uh, with that uh, respect. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea. So I see that uh, that um, some of you, some of the research paper also had discussed the relationship with the conceptual framework, and I um, I. Um, do the, does the conceptual framework in its present uh, form give some help with the respect to understand how the, the discount rates should be, be set? And secondly, sh or should there be should there be a framework for discount rates, uh, uh, or should there be an additional framework for 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 discount rates? I see in your paper, Pierre and Veronique. You have some comments upon that there should be more consistency, both with uh, with uh, terminology and the concept. So uh, maybe you can comment a little upon this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, and, uh, the first thing, uh, as Rasmussen indicated earlier, the, is the, the question of the purpose of the valuation measure. Uh, this has to be uh, asked before dealing with uh, a focus on uh, on discount rate on uh, discount rates. So, uh, if the question is uh, what role does discounting play in, uh, in valuation? Uh, as a matter of fact, it always reflects the time value of money and often serves as an adjustment to value uh, the risk of uh, what's being measured. And maybe. Uh, Dealing with a uh, conceptual framework, uh, this could be an, uh, an involvement in order to uh, to give some uh, indication about uh, what kind of uh, information about risk uh, could be captured by uh, present value measurement when you are uh, projecting cash flows and uh, eventually uh, dealing with uh, distributions. And if you don't do that, of, or if you don't do that uh, with all of the risks uh, of the future cash flows, uh, how to uh, adapt the, the discount rates in order to, uh, to integrate a risk premium. And uh, maybe uh, IFR 17 could be an example uh, for this kind of uh, prescription, because uh, in IFR 17, uh, you have uh, uh, three, but uh, two components of the liability, which are the, the, the current estimate and the risk adjustment. And for example, the risk adjustment is only for non-financial risks. And in the current, and it's a, it's an amount you have in the, in the liability. And uh, in the current estimate, uh, you are projecting future cash flows with uh, best estimate assumptions. And uh, discounting uh, means uh, time value of money, and uh, it uh, incorporates uh, market premiums, uh, uh, premiums for market risks. And so there is a, a, a clear distinction between what's added to the liability, the risk adjustment, which is for so, such risks, such as uh, non-financial risks, and uh, it's more clear about what's in the present value in the current estimates. So m maybe it could be uh, an example. But of course, uh, when you deal with uh, insurance contracts, uh, you deal with uh, pooling, mutualization, and uh, you may you make such uh, such measurements at some level, which is not uh, uh, an uh, unique uh, item, but a pooling of contracts. And so this has to be uh, considered too, I think. Thank you, Pierre. Um, let me now move on to the next uh, set of, uh, or the next topic that we agreed upon. So if we now acknowledge that there is uh, a variation in the requirement across standards, so we take that as a given datum, and then uh, additionally, there are variation in the practice across firms for, for a given standard then. 
so for instance, the research paper called the black box accounting about uh, the commissioning liabilities document that there are uh, variations in choosing the, the, the discount rate uh, among firms and similarly for the, the pension accounting, which is discussed in uh, the paper, uh, the theory and practice. So we have some documentation about that. So my question to you then is the is the vari a variety in or the variation in discounting practice and disclosure an impediment to the usefulness of financial reporting? Alistair, I invite you to start uh, giving your uh, thoughts about this. Okay, thanks, thanks, Erland, and, and hi everyone. Sorry, Erland, just to make clear, I actually retired from uh, Ernst Young on Monday, so I'm no longer. <laughs> um, but I have spent the last 25 years as being the lead order partner in some of the largest oil and gas companies uh, in the world, so I, I can just give you my perspective from that in terms of how practice has changed, you know, over quite a long period. And particularly very, very recently, practice has changed quite dramatically. Um, I mean, so far, we've had quite a bleak picture painted of the state of discounting and financial reporting. And I don't think things are as bad as, as maybe some, some think or some have portrayed. Um, I do, you know, I do agree with what, what's been said before. I think Sue's points about we need to have measurement objectives. We need to know what the key inputs are and so on in individual standards. Some standards are very old, like IS 37, IS 36. We have 17, which uh, Sue says is the poster child. So we've got to take that into account. So maybe there is an opportunity for, for standards to be updated where it's clear what the measurement objectives are and give some much more give much more guidance on what the inputs what the inputs should be. But variety in practice is what we need because we don't want uniformity in accounting. Otherwise, we may as well say, well, all assets should be discounted at 10% and all liabilities at 5%, and then we can get some, some uniformity. So I don't think that's, that's where we want to be. There is, there is variety in practice, and I think that variety in practice does stem from the fact that we don't have clarity on measurement objectives, et cetera. So that's, you know, that's, that's where we are. Uh, uh, at the moment, just to comment on a, on a few on a few uh, aspects that have been said, I don't necessarily think that discounting of decommissioning and restoration uh, provisions is a black box. Certainly not in terms of recent uh, disclosures. Unfortunately, the research only went up to 2016, and really what hasn't been reflected is that we've we've had the Paris Agreement, and since the Paris Agreement, the uh, the pressure that's been put on companies has been extraordinarily great uh, from lobbyists and so on. And the quality of the accounting and the disclosure which companies are now producing is very, very substantially enhanced. So if you were to look at the, uh, of the, look at the 2020 accounts of the large companies like BP and Shell and so on, you will see some very detailed disclosure explaining uh, how they determine their discount rates, what they are, what the ranges are, how they've adjusted for risk, uh, sometimes with sensitivity analysis. So I actually believe that there is very considerable disclosure to be found now, and I and I think that that's that's fine. And you wouldn't expect the same discount rates being used for, for example, onshore uh, onshore upstream assets versus you know deep water upstream assets. So. Um, the idea that you have different discount rates being applied within the same company between companies, that's, that's what I would expect because we have very different, uh, very different assets that we need to, uh, to deal with. The issue of whether you discount, uh, uh, sorry, risk the cash flows or risk the discount rate is a very, very uh, interesting point and a big debate amongst auditors. My preference is that cash flow should be risked because of this, that's what I think finance theory tells you. Um, so, as an auditor, it's much easier to audit the risking of cash flows than it is to say, well, we, we take our WAC and then we add 2% and that's our discount rate, which is, which is sometimes what happens in practice. So, I, you know, my experience is my, I've, I've had a much better experience where, where cash flows have been risked rather than discount rates, which are, which are pretty arbitrary. 
And just to end off in terms of decommissioning liabilities, it's important to realise that decommissioning and restoration liabilities are very different liabilities. And I'll give you an example. If you have an oil refinery, the, uh, the decommissioning of the oil refinery is closing it down and it might be removing it. And the technology has changed and, and the, the latest technology that's used sometimes just to use explosives to destroy it and then take the iron away. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, exercise in decommissioning a refinery. But the, next, the, the restoration cost is the, is the issue, the restoration of the land on which it stood. And what companies are, are doing is saying, well, uh, we, don't need to restore, we don't need to restore the land because what we'll do is we'll build a tank farm on the land or we'll turn the refinery into an oil terminal or whatever, and therefore we don't have to determine the restoration liability or we consider our restoration liability to be zero. But in terms of determining these liabilities, if I think of the downstream assets like chemicals, plants and, and refineries, just to end off, there are a lot of inputs into those provisions and the discount rate is actually one of the easiest because it's the, it's the projection of the cash flows over sometimes a very long period. And if you look at, um, if you look at Shell's accounts, for example, you'll see that they distinguish between refineries which have an estimated life of less than 50 years and those of more than 50 years and they treat them separately. Up until two years ago, all the oil and gas companies said our refineries are going to last for more than 100 years, therefore we don't need to provide because it's immaterial. The other issue, just sorry to end off, is, is, is technology because the standard only allows you to, to make the uh, provision based on current technology. And of course, technology changes very rapidly in terms of decommissioning and particularly restoration. And so that is why companies update their provisions annually. So where we see changes in, in, in the accounts year on year, that's because things are changing. Um, so timing is very difficult, technology is difficult, um, and, and that's why they are, are reviewed, uh, reviewed annually. So, uh, 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 you know, lots of big issues in determining those, but the big issue is the disclosure. And what's happening certainly in the UK is that the regulators are enforcing IS1 Para 25, which requires companies to disclose key, key estimates and, and, and judgments. And that's what companies are providing a huge amount of information around key estimates and judgments, including these sorts of, uh, these sorts of, li these sorts of liabilities. But I do think there's a big difference between discounting long-term receivables and discounting in uh, determining of restoration provisions. Sorry, uh, Alant, if I went on a bit longer. Oh, you touched upon a lot of interesting points, uh, Alistair. Uh, so I think some of it uh, I want to come back to. I want also to, to challenge uh, the other panelists about the question of, about the risk assessment in cash flows versus discount rate that you touched upon. But I want to, to for the moment, stick to the question of the variation in practice and the, the, the disclosures. And uh, also, what what uh, what do we expect auditors and enforcers, uh, regulators, to do with that? Could I uh, ask about your opinion about that, uh, Andre? Yeah, sure. Um, um, first, I agree uh, that that variety in practice and 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 having di different uh, discount rates for for different um, situations, topics. Uh, that's, that's very important. Uh, it should not be um, uh, one uniform discount rate. Uh, and it's also uh, what, what, what Andrea said, it's um, judgment by, by the um, reporting entity is, is a, a very important um, um, and to, to, to provide that and to, to provide also um, um, information and disclosure about that. But um, I want to come back to um, what what uh, Ian said uh, in his uh, talk around uh, IS19 and um, working on that topic um, uh, um, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I de definitely see their their um, variety in in practice and also some things that, in my view, um, are um, hindering kind of comparability and and the usefulness of um, 
financial reporting. As Ian said, there are um, sometimes variations in discount rates of, of uh, 100 basis points or something like that. And that's that's fine if you consider different types of plans in different uh, um, legislation jurisdictions around the world, lump sum plans, um, annuity plans, um, um, new plans, um, older mature plans. There are uh, definitely reasons for for having different rates, but when you closely look into it, um, you you can find um, plans that are very similar, but where um, in the existing framework of the standards of IS-19, you can come um, uh, perfectly well elaborated uh, from a mathematical and actuarial standpoint and auditable and et cetera. You can come to a discount rates that maybe have a variety of, of 50 or more basis points for the same, for a very uh, uh, similar uh, um, obligation, uh, uh, a similar cash flow profile, but you come to very, very different uh, accounting approaches. And I, I, I really very much question whether that is useful information for users, um, especially if, if it's not accompanied with um, uh, respective disclosures that, um, that underpin the judgment by the company uh, on that uh, uh, issue. Um, and in and, 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 and considering the um, the exposure draft on EIS 19, um, it, it may even be that disclosures on, on discount rates may, um, may, may be less in the future. I don't know. So I think there is, a, there is definitely an issue we need to work on. Thank you, Andre. Let's uh, move over to the thing that you both uh, touched uh, upon. What are the what what is the the, the correct uh, discount rate? If we can uh, talk about that, uh, is uh, well, I guess that everybody would answer that uh, there is, it's not possible to define a correct uh, discount rate for uh, all uh, possible situations, but. What are the properties that we should put into a discount rate, or let me say, into a discount a discounting model? So uh, feel free also to discuss the question about adjustment in cash flows and and uh, versus rates, uh, risk adjustments in cash flow versus the risk adjustments in the discount rate. Um, Andrea, I'm sure that you have some uh, thoughts about this, these questions. Yes, yes, it's my pleasure to answer to these questions. From my uh, personal perspective, there is uh, the, the, the right discount rate, the unique discount rate does not exist. Uh, there is um, a variety, as we said before, a variety of industries, a variety of uh, measurements, and we need to keep a variety in, uh, in our in our framework. Uh, so uni uni uniformity is not uh, is not uh, is not a, the answer in this case. And um, this, the, the the answer is that we we need a discount rate that needs to be uh, explained to the world, right? So to the to the to the investors, to the financial analysts. So the all the uh, all the reasoning behind the discount rate that's been chosen by 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 an industry, and I agree with what has been said before from Alistair. In certain cases, we have exceptional disclosures. Certain firms uh, give a lot of disclosure on the discount rate. That's great, but uh, it's not always the case. So I would rather go for um, for uh, as, I, as, I, as I repeat myself as I said before, for a more comprehensive disclosure. So challenge the company to really provide their considerations, uh, their reasoning about the specific discount rate that, was, that, that were used. I think, uh, having said that, we don't need, uh, we, we need to be careful not to, uh, let's say, to underestimate the, the importance of discount rate in, in, the, in the insurance industry, uh, we said before, the standard setter came, came out with the IFR 17 standard, and that provides significant uh, changes and improvements, in my view, to the overall uh, financial statement. So making sure that we can, uh, as, as a financial analyst or investor, to, to better, uh, to, 
to have a better picture of the reality of a firm. I mean, there, let, let's think about uh, what happened in the early 80s and the early 90s with some life insurance companies in, ja in Japan that they went uh, they went insolvent. So uh, because uh, they uh, they didn't really consider uh, an environment where interest rates were going down so dramatically and that they had, they had obligation towards their clients with uh, very high interest rates. They could guarantee very high interest rates. So the, um, we, 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 the company still can make mistakes by applying at any discount rate. Nobody has the right answer today. Uh, however, what we should, uh, we should provide I repeat to myself, better comprehensive disclosure so that uh, in 10 years from now, we'll see what was the decision and what was the reasoning behind. And nobody can blame the company or can see that they made the wrong decision, for example. But that's that's business. That's the way business is. Okay, thank you, Andrea. But uh, uh, you didn't uh, really answer my challenge about uh, the, the risk, uh, where the risk assessment should, or adjustment should be made. Actually, uh, as I hear you, you say that uh, we put the uh, risk adjustments in the discount rate and then we make uh, sufficient disclosures so that uh, users can understand what has been done. Is that uh, correctly understood? Go on uh, there. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't go for. Uh, I've seen in the uh, that there are discussion about what's the uh, correct discount rate if you can use a free uh, market risk or uh, plus the liquid premium rate. Or uh, of course, uh, as I said, I would like to leave personally. That's my view. Like to leave uh, judge certain judgment to the companies to use. The, the interest rate, the, the discount rate, they think it makes more sense for them because it really depends also from the industry. We discussed about uh, oil, comp uh, oil industry is completely different from financial services industry. And um, what uh, what what I what I was uh, highlighting is that the, the let's really the disclosure in terms of what were the drivers of the decisions of taking choosing certain discount rate. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. But I have heard some of you argue for the, 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 the cash flow uh, uh, risk adjustments. So I would like to, to challenge some of you uh, to explain me exactly how that should be done. So I heard Veronique uh, say in her presentations that she thought that uh, students could learn Monte Carlo simulation, but is that enough? Shouldn't you? Wouldn't you need to know what kind of parameters that you should put into that that simulation, and how should a standard setter go about to explain what are those parameters? Can I challenge you, Pierre? Yes, of course, uh, I think that what are we talking about? We are talking about uh, present value measurement. Uh, and uh, when you uh, when you're projecting cash flows, uh, there are some risks uh, around this uh, projection uh, about these cash flows and uncertainties. And uh, um, what we uh, what we say with Veronique is that uh, when uh, when this kind of risks uh, are material. Uh, they have to be captured for uh, uh, coaching purposes, of course. And uh, we suggest that if we can uh, model them uh, to measure uh, their impact, uh, their distribution of the, on the cash flows and on the present value, uh, they could be uh, counting, uh, uh, for example, like in uh, IFS 17, and but there, there are so many risks. So for some risks, it's possible you can uh, have an int uh, about the, the distribution or to deal with uh, scenarios. And there are other risks where it's uh, too complicated. Uh, you don't have uh, enough data or you don't know uh, uh, the risk. And uh, you may have an uh, overall, overall appreciation of this kind of risk and uh, maybe translate uh, that to uh, risk premium and so uh, but 
overall, the, 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 the message is the, the following is to give some information of those risks and uh, to disclose, to, to give some disclosures about, not only disclosures, so what kind of risk do you account for uh, separately? Mm -hmm. For example, with a cash flow risk adjustment, and what kind of risk uh, do you consider for determining uh, risk premium, risk premium in the discount rates? So, and if you do that, you give some uh, information in the disclosures about those risks. Uh, what are they? Uh, how do you translate those risks uh, into uh, risk premium? Uh, I think this could uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, ability for uh, users of financial statement to uh, to understand what uh, what's in the uh, financial standard. Okay, so now I hear from you that you also foresee a possible combination about the risk adjustment. Yes, yes, in of course. Um, okay. Sue, can you help us also on this, these issues? Can uh, what uh, what can we expect from uh, from uh, from standard setters to to explain uh, to preparers how they shall do the risk adjustments in the discount rates or in the cash flows, whatever? What do you think? <laughs> Well, I think historically we've tended to be um, relatively neutral in the sense that the thing that we've tended to emphasise, and I think correctly, is there should be congruence between what you've done with the cash flows and what you do with the discount rate. So don't sort of discount unlike with unlike. Make sure you've got like mm. with like. So mm. you can think about you can think about risk either in the cash flows, but then think about your discount rate differently. And I think that that's that's helpful because we don't really want to dictate how people do their analysis as opposed to describe what the outcome should be and to promote consistency. And I think we see a relationship between our role and then other disciplines, which are, you know, valuation specialists, et cetera, who have got more specifics than to, to add to that. And that's how we tend to see things. So I think our objective, you, the, the question is, you know, is there a correct rate I think there should be a. I think it's helpful for financial reporting personally if it's cl if it's clear for a particular type of item that's being accounted for that everybody's trying to aim for the same thing. If I can put it that way. So if you're measuring a, I don't know, a financial asset, a, a bond that everybody's aiming for the same thing. If they're using amortized cost measurement, if you're aiming for a decommissioning liability no matter which industry you're in. I think you'd want everybody to be thinking about things in mm. the same way. Now, there's going to be differences in the actual numbers they come up with because of different maturities, because of the way they approach the cash flows, all of those sorts of things. But I think you want a common understanding of what it is you're shooting for, if I can put it that way. And I think the challenge for us from a standard setting perspective is What's the best level of guidance to give to people so that they're clear about what they need to do? So how much help do they need from us to know what to do? And I, and I think that's something that as a standard setter, you know, I'm constantly watching. And, and it's actually interesting the level of questions that we get, even on things that I wouldn't have ex expected questions on. So if I use a relatively simple example in our new leasing standard, we talk about using the incremental borrowing rate. And I've had more questions about what that means than on just about anything else, even though I thought it was quite a simple idea. So um, I think it's just something we constantly need to monitor sort of in the system to see what's enough for people to be clear about what they have to do. Yes, thank you. Uh, the very interesting views. I, I think also just to, to add to that, that uh, when we're talking about uh, risk adjustment in cash flows that um, we many of us will favor that but i mean they are almost n not described in textbooks if you compare with the risk adjustments in these contracts which are general knowledge for anybody that uh, that, that uh, enters into a business school whereas the 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 the, the, the cash flow adjustments they are uh, they are uh, very little developed in the in the textbooks and in the lectures. Alistair, I give you. Uh, uh, we have not so much time left on this question, but I give you the word. Yeah, just one sentence. I think I think though the, the companies 
know very well about risking of cash flows. So through their through their budgeting process, mm -hmm. they are very they are very accustomed to the way that they risk their fu their future cash flows in terms of their whole uh, planning and budgeting process. So that's why it is uh, you know from my perspective as an auditor uh, much easier to audit than a random number that's just added on to a weighted average cost of capital. So. Mm -hmm. Companies are very familiar with it. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have come to the point where we shall have the polling questions. So those should be presented on the screen. What? What uh, are there instructions to be given, Saskia or uh, Rasmus, for for uh, for um, the participants? No, the participants can just. Uh... Basically. They know what to do. They know what to do. It's very evident. Uh... Thank you, Saskia. Okay, so and we, the moderator and the panelists, we just go on with our discussion while you, the audience, you fill in the the, the polling questions. So, what I will um, take you to now are the things that many of you are <laughs> interested in and eager about and have touched upon already. What are uh, the views on the discounting requirements of IS-19 specifically? And uh, pension expert, Andre, you can start. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I try also to, to, to maybe touch briefly upon some questions I think that I've seen coming up um, in the in the chat, if that's okay. Please so do. I think there, so there was one question I saw uh, around uh, um, with 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 buyout buyouts of DB pension schemes increasing um, um, in, in in various jurisdictions. Is it? Um, yeah, um, still something for the future to have a different or a specific standard on, on um, yeah, discounting or valuing um, employee benefits like IS-19 or whether other concepts uh, from the insurance um, um, accounting uh, would be more um, more feasible or more uh, applicable here. Um, I personally would would not go into that direction um, because um, yes, there is a trend in in um, in, in buyouts in in the DB world, but um, there is uh, still a DB world out there, and and buyouts are not uh, feasible in all jurisdictions in the same way um, um, on 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 the continent uh, in, in Europe, there are um, various jurisdictions where it's not so so easy, um, where other models um, are used or where buyouts are not so prevalent. So I think there is uh, enough reason uh, to have uh, um, a separate uh, standard and to take into account what is um, employee benefits about, what is occupational pensions about, which is um, something where you have a have a uh, have a plan sponsor, um, which is different from an uh, insurance company in in my view. Um, so that that would be uh, one one comment uh, on that. And I uh, also saw a question, and that is uh, something I, I would also like to to comment on uh, around whether new, the, the the concept of neutrality um in in, in uh, accounting and um so um, um the accounting uh, standard should not uh, influence how um um as a company decide um on on how to invest my pension assets or that should not influence uh, uh this this investment decision but um um, increasingly so, I think we see in practice that the accounting uh, and the discounting uh, in IS-19 have, have an influence on on that. So I think that is an um, issue and it could um, be um, a, a solution or at least something that is worthwhile um, considering or re, um, revisiting whether also the for the funded part of uh, employee benefits, whether um, the 
the expected return on the on the um, pension plan assets could be uh, part or could could influence also the setting of the discount rate. I think that is um, uh, something worthwhile considering. Um, yeah, um, some some additional points, and then I stop here for for others to comment. Um, also, the the high um, the, the 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 notion of a high quality uh, corporate bond rate uh, in IS nineteen. So, question is what what exactly is that? I, I have the feeling that over time, um, kind of a practice has developed for that um, a market practice to to interpret that as double A. Uh, but um, um, yeah, while while um, applying judgment, um, companies preparers would uh, derive um, nowadays possibly at a different answer. So um, um, before we we mentioned that judgment is important and um, um, disclosure about judgment is important. So um, I would um, suggest that we also should. Uh, consider that, and uh, in that context, also um, we should consider there is kind of a two-track two system around discount rates. Um, if if there are so such corporate bond rates um, in other markets where they aren't, there is a fallback to to government bond rates. So a couple of uh, things uh, definitely uh, to uh, to consider, and where I see room for improvement. But uh, can you just uh, explain to the audience what is the logic of the high quality corporate uh, rate for discounting pension? Why did we have? Uh, why why, why did we arrive there? Um, so I, I think the 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 reason is to have um, kind of a um, 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 a uniform approach, not to to. Uh, Adjust it uh, for for own um, for own credit risk of the company, so not to to um, um, yeah have um, uh, companies with uh, um, with um, um, yeah um, let's say a, a higher risk, um, therefore um, ending up with with lower liabilities, for example. So I think generally the idea that um, the IS19 discount rate is not uh, connected to to investment um, or to rating of the company is is um, I think a, a good one. The question that I have is what is um, what is um, high quality corporate bond here, and um, is the answer that that has been given uh, twenty or more years ago from coming from 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 the U.S. GAAP world uh, and and uh, uh, from other sources. Uh, is it still the right answer today? Thank you, Andre. And um, I noticed that in your uh, the one that treats uh, the, the the research paper that uh, deals with um, IS19, the theory and practice of discounting. So Jan Klatcher, so you in this. Paper actually, you 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 claim that there is there really exists a, a correct discount rate for pension liabilities. I saw that uh, I think on page 41 in your uh, research paper. Can you explain to the audience and to, and to the panelists what is the discount the correct discount rate and where do, do we find it? So the idea that underpins this is there is a contractual obligation that sets out what you're expected to get as a pensioner when you retire. So there is a contribution rate that goes in from your employer. There is a contribution rate that goes in from you as an employee. If you're fortunate, you'll get some tax relief on that, which makes it more valuable. And on that projection, there is a target amount that that's meant to achieve to then have sufficient assets to then be dispersed to you over your lifetime. And we call that the contractual accrual rate. And so it is actually set within the terms of an individual's employment contract as to what the appropriate discount rate should be. And that will change through time. It's equivalent to an, an IRR. 
And so that gives you a, a value of the pension liability and the obligation that the firm has to meet. The assets held to meet that are independent of that. But actually, the way in which we've, and it's in the paper too, we talk about counterfactual discount rates. Yeah. So if you take the current approach, for me, what the current approach says is if this pension fund was to be invested wholly in AA bonds, this is the current position that scheme would be in, which is a different question in terms of what is the, the ultimate obligation that the, the company is going to have to pay. And because we've got into that sort of realm of ambiguity, then we've not got an objective view of what the long-term position of the, the pension scheme is. And what we see is almost like a short-term solvency position. So I think there's useful information in that. It says, to, for me, the way in which I look at the current approach, it's, a, it's equivalent to saying, if this company had to go bankrupt, what is a rough approximation of the liabilities that this company has and what assets are there to meet it? It doesn't reflect the long-term position of the firm. And so the current approach, I think, is useful, but you then get into how do you recognise long-term positions and how do you then start to make decisions around where a company currently is? And I think another disclosure, which we've seen increase through time in this area, which is very useful, is what are the expected cash flows that the firm is going to be paying out in the next three, five years. And so some of that, if you look at some of the, the large banks in the UK, they will show what contributions are normal contributions and what contributions are deficit recovery. And so they're going beyond just the, the sort of valuation and measurement point to start to show investors actually the, the, the money which uh, the company is going to be paying into the scheme. And that, that's much more based on the regulatory environment, which is what really governs corporate action. So the accounting number only reflects a, a particular picture. It doesn't actually show what the ultimate obligation is that the company has agreed to, nor does it show the sort of actual decisions and behaviours that are taking place due to the regulatory environment. But still, can I ask you about this uh, this um, uh, contractual accrual rate, which is an IRR, you say, an internal rate of return? So normally, when we calculate an internal rate of return, we have at least two cash flows with opposite signs. So we can equate the, 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 the IRR is the one that equates the present value of those two cash flows. And if there are more cash flows, it will be the one that 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 uh, that uh, that uh, gives the net present value of zero. But when you make a, a pension promise, say you have an employee and you say uh, when you when you reach the age of seventy, I will give you hundred thousand euros, uh, and you don't do anything today. How should you calculate the internal rate of return of that? That's a defined benefit obligation, I guess. So, um, um, you mean with no contributions between now and then? Well, if you have contributions, then you have to have a discount rate that decides what are the size of the contributions. So that is circular. So no contributions. You just uh, just uh, give the promise. This is a de defined benefit obligation. How do that's you calculate the inter internal rate of return? That's a bullet bond. It's got a terminal value. There is a payment that is out in the future, and you're on the on the hook for it. You're obligated to pay it. Yeah. So it's a bullet bond. You would... Well, because it's a bullet payment, I'll, I'll have to come back to you because we've looked at this before, and I don't want to get it wrong. No, no, but uh, I understand that you you don't. I don't want want to push you anymore. I I, I just say that uh, I think that uh, that uh, well when you talk about contributions and uh, and uh, and um, and these contributions, as long as you say that you have a fair contribution for a um, promise in the future, then of course uh, it's possible to calculate uh, 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 an internal rate of return. But the defined benefit obligations, as they are defined, that they are not 
dependent on you having contributions to it when you when you do make the promise. Okay, anyone else that wants to come in on the question of uh, of uh, the, the the discounting for for um, for uh, pension obligations here. I see nobody on my list now. I can so I can um, comment on why we don't at the moment use a um, return on the assets of the discount rate if that's that's useful and. Um, Andre mentioned that that came from US GAAP, and I think that is the the genesis. But I think that the the I shouldn't bind the board, but I think <laughs> I think the logic still still holds. And the logic was really that there is no if if you've got um, benefits which are linked to the return on assets, that's slightly different. But if you don't have that case, then the concern was that you by um, investing in in risky bonds, you'd have a smaller liability. Whereas if, in fact, your assets ended up with no value at all, you'd still have an obligation. So it doesn't change the value of your obligation, what your assets are, when, when you have a defined obligation. And so really all that the, um, the high-quality corporate bonds is doing is dealing with time value of money. But because there is no link between the assets and the obligation that you're on the hook for, that's not accepted as the discount rate. That that's the logic of what we have today. Thank and, you. And we did actually look at one point at removing this sort of parallel uh, model, this two-track system of government bond rates and um, high-quality bond rates. Um, and the board got feedback on so many issues of complexity that it raised that they didn't pursue that, but it was something that did get looked at at one point in time. Thank you, Sue. I think we have come to the point where we shall look at the, the answer to the polling questions. Can we have that on the screen? Or I, uh, yes, yeah, I see we have the results here in Okay, so I see that uh, there are some results here in the chat. So, um, sorry. Um, okay, which of the following discount rates would you consider would result in the most useful information in the financial statements for a defined benefit pension obligation? And the first uh, question was uh, the li liability should not be discounted. Uh, and that was 15%, uh, 16% that said yes to that. Expected return on the assets held to meet the liability, 42%. So that's the, the highest score, actually. Then uh, the incremental borrowing rate it has 0%. The WAC has 4%, the effective interest have 2%, company specific bond yield 2%, return on equity 0%. Rate of return that reflects the beta of the, the beta of the liability 6 or oh, 7%. High quality corporate bond yields 4%. They don't like that one. Um, a rate set by government or for regulatory purposes, 13%. I do not know, 7% and other 2%. So that where was the results of that poll question. Actually, the expected return on the assets held to meet the liability had a large, large majority, actually. Um, anyone that wants to comment upon that. Andre, what about, uh, have you some ideas? Yeah, as I said before, I think that that is definitely something that, that is on, on preparers' minds. And I, I could totally um, get Sue's, Sue's point why the, why the board in the past has, has decided against that. But uh, I think um, also considering what we discussed before, um, 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 yeah, valuable disclosures around that um, 
um, could could uh, could help to work with such an approach, um, so that you um, understand what what um, are our companies investing um, in. And I think um, the um, the the that 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 companies will not um, let's say invest in more riskier assets just to just to reduce um the 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 present value of their liabilities um, um in 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 their own um, investment and risk assessment decisions thank you jan short uh, briefly now uh, jan it was just to come back on your puzzling question um <laughs> no i like questions like that but it took me aback um it wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to set up a contract like that so there has to be a consideration in law for a contract to take place, and a promise like that has no consideration in it. So it's theoretically nice to sort of put out there, but actually in reality it wouldn't take place. You wouldn't be allowed a contract like that. Okay, we leave it there. So we go over to the the last topic that we agreed to discuss, that are. I just state the question as I wrote it down to you. What are the panelists' views on the particular issues relating to the to present value measurement on non-financial liabilities? So, and non-financial liabilities, for instance, the decommissioning liabilities that are discussed in one of these papers are in focus in this question. Alistair, can I? Ask for your yeah view first. Well, and yeah, just just uh, I don't want to repeat what I've uh, already said. I mean, I don't I don't think uh, companies are using discount rates opportunistically. I think there are some real challenges, and and uh, one of the biggest the biggest challenges is timing. So it's got a very long term liability. Uh, the the estimation of the timing of that liability is very difficult. Uh, particularly in DNR provisions, which which can go out decades, if not yeah, you know, even not even you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. So that's why historically companies actually haven't provided for DNR liabilities because of the the timing. That's now changed with Paris, and it's changed uh, quite dramatically. And companies are making provisions, but timing is still an issue. Estimating the cash flows. Is an issue um, determining determining a, uh, a discount rate, as I've said previously, for over, for a very long period. I mean, how do you how do you determine what a discount rate is for a 60-year liability, for example? So there are a, a number of a number of very very practical issues, and then there's the the risking of the the risking of the cash flows as well, which is which is a problem. So there's a huge amount of judgment. That goes into into these provisions, and that's why you know I I agree with Andrea. The mo the most important thing is we have to get the disclosure right. We have to be much more specific on what disclosure is required. The rate determination of the rates, how we determined, how we adjusted for risk, a sensitivity analysis of of uh, of the various parameters in it. So uh, a lot of very very practical issues. Um, that companies are grappling with, but I think um, I think disclosure is is very very important, coupled with the IS1125 disclosure of of how you've determined your key estimates and judgments. And specifically with respect to risk adjustment for these liabilities, should you have a decommissioning liability that uh, matures 50 years from now. How would you do the uh, the, the risk adjustment for that. Uh, there is you are, there is uncertain uncertain measurement of what will be the cash outflow in in 50 years, and and you have to take it into consideration. Well, how do you do it? You know, so so th th what I've what I've seen in practice, for example, uh, just to give one example, uh, um, you, companies would start perhaps with a P50 uh, assessment of their of their uh, the, the 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 cash flows, and then they would look at other risks, and then risk it further than that. So it's really 
getting a starting point, so estimating cash flows, taking a, a P50 position, and then uh, adding additional, uh, you know, adjusting for additional risk on top of that. So that's the sort of approach that gets taken, and that's why I think it's much more important that companies disclose what they're doing so investors can compare, you know, your, your different your different companies between each other in terms of the methodology that they've, that they've applied. It's interesting that under U.S. GAAP is when you set up a, uh, uh, if you set up a decommissioning liability, you set the discount rate when you set it up, and that doesn't change, um, which is very, very different to the way we do it in, uh, you know, in IFRS, where we reassess the provision every year, re-looking at the cash flows, re-looking at the risks, reassessing the technology that will be available uh, to perform the, D, you know, the DNR and so on. So, again, a very, very difficult to compare, you know, ExxonMobil and, and Chevron with Shell and BP, for example. Thank you, Alistair. Marie, can I uh, challenge you for uh, also for yes. some minutes here? Yes, of course. Uh, well, one characteristic of these kind of liabilities is that the the um, the liability is a, the the value of the liability is just a proxy of fiscal uh, of a physical liability, and that doesn't go away if a company fails. So that means that at the end of the day, the residual assets of a company will not have many buyers because because of this liability that is still there and it has to be something has to be done to it, and that means that many of these liabilities end up with the public. And there we have two things, I think. One of them is something that Alistair, I agree with Alistair that yes, we need more disclosure, definitely. Um, but there's also that you mentioned now that after the Paris Agreement, all of a sudden these liabilities are now recognized. They are now material. And I, what I'm after here is the materiality. How do we decide on what's material, and I don't think there's much guidance here, because uh, if we look at the guidance for materiality, then we have that um, that, that should affect the decision process for investors or creditors, but they are not affected here. It's the public. So I think that might have caused that. I do understand that external pressures, this research and that, will make companies becoming more forthcoming. Then as to the to the discount rate or how to discount for this kind of liability, the the horizon is so long as Alistair pointed out, and that means that the the effects and the costs will be actually borne by somebody in another generation. It's sort of far into the future. So there are people who argue that there should be this sort of to set the discount rate is an eth ethical consideration. It's sort of how much of the burden on the wealth, welfare or wealth of future generations, how much weight are we going to put on them? That will be decided in the discount rate. Um, so that would be those two arguments. Did I answer your question? How important do you think that argument with the, the question that uh, that um, uh, if they fail on the on the obligation, then it moves on to someone else? Well, you could say the same about financial liabilities, couldn't you? And even if there are long-term financial liabilities, meaning that if the if the firm fails, then, then they will not, or if it goes bankrupt, then it will not. Uh, uh, honor its uh, its uh, financial obligation, and then they, there are others that will uh, will take the, the the loss, and that is not necessarily today's creditors because that is, that that uh, that, uh, that debt might be tradable. So there are someone else that takes the loss. What? Uh, well, the, uh, the same like, yeah, but. There you have a claimant, so there is somebody taking the loss and the liability goes away. But in the in these cases, in these cases, then uh, the uh, the public will actually have to do the cleanup of it. And I think the longevity is an issue here that Alistair pointed out. They are extremely 
long horizons for these uh, liabilities. Yes. Okay, so I have on, um, I have two first. Just, just on this materiality point. Um, so if, if I'm an investor in a company and I'm trying to work out, you know, how much I think the company's worth and whether I want to be an investor or not, and I'm looking at, I look at the assets and, and what I think, you know, they're worth, and I look at the obligations that need to be met from the assets and work out, you know, what that means for me in sort of a net asset position. To me, I would have thought that with the um, increasing emphasis on, on these sorts of liabilities, investors are increasingly interested in them because they know they're creating potential claims on the company and also could affect its future business model. So I'm not sure to me that whether I whether the company's got an obligation to clean up or an obligation to pay a long dated financial liability that the materiality assessment is really really that different. So I think it's material in both cases and I don't really understand why because ultimately if it's not done by the company the state might have to take it over is um really changing that from an investor's perspective because it's still a claim on assets. Thank you, Sue. I have Alistair. Yeah, so, so I agree with what, what's been said, but, but the materiality uh, is, is possibly more a question of, of uh, qualitatively material than, than quantitatively material. And, and it's around the disclosures, around the fact that these liabilities exist. But the, the, the measurement of them uh, uh, could be that the, the actual the actual uh, current value is is actually immaterial or, or not very material. So there are there are disclosures around the existence of the liabilities, uh, and there might be provisions in the accounts for those liabilities. But they would they would generally would be very small at the moment. In terms of in terms of uh, if a company fails, it immediately goes to the state or whatever or the, or the public. That's not that's not really the case. I mean. Oil and gas companies change hands all the time, or oil and gas assets change has, uh, hands all the time, and the and the buyers are happy to take on uh, take on the liability. So you know, refineries uh, refineries is a lot of trading in refineries at the moment. People are buying and selling refineries, and if you buy a refinery, you take on the the DNR provisions that that are associated with it. If a if a company were to fail, um, it is most likely that the assets would be taken on, uh, taken on by someone else or bought by someone else, and so the liability doesn't automatically default to the to the state or to society. Um, there will be always be buyers and sellers. The question, the question that you know, you know, is 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 the music going to stop eventually, and we're going to have all these liabilities and and no one to pay for them? But at the moment, um, I don't think it. I don't think it's an issue as long as. Investors can see that companies disclose the existence of these liabilities, and they are provided for, even though those provisions are likely to be quite small. The other important bit of disclosure, which some people tend to uh, miss, is that if if you know if I'm a, if I'm an oil and gas company and I and I sell a refinery uh, to someone else, part of the big decision making in the sale and the price is the is the uh, is the strength of the company buying it. Because I can never get rid of that liability. That liability, although it passes legally to the to the buyer, if that buyer fails, it comes back to me. And so, if you look at the contingent liability notes of of oil and gas companies, you will see that they have disclosed contingent liabilities for assets uh, that they've sold to third parties, which might uh, which might eventually come back back to them as well. So, I think the disclosures there of the existence of these liabilities from a qualitative point of view. Quantitatively, um, provisions are made, but at the moment, they are not, uh, they are not massive. Thank you, Alistair. But while you're talking, can you also uh, come up with a view on, on the question of own credit risk for the measurement of this liability. So if I think I have uh, I have such an obligation that matures next year, but I think it's 50% uh, 
probability that uh, I will not uh, be able to, to honor it, so I will default. Should I take that into consideration when I measure the measure the the the, the liability? I ask you, Alistair. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I mean this is all part about what what the measurement objectives are of IS 37. Um, I'm not a I, I'm personally I'm not a supporter of the use of own credit risk in this sort of situ sort of situation. Would we be saying that if we brought our own credit risk into account? We would then reduce, you know, reduce the discount rate even further, perhaps to perhaps to zero, because the discount rates are very are very low as they are at the moment. So, at the moment, I haven't seen really the arguments for bringing own credit risk into into the measurement of these sorts of uh, these sorts of li liabilities. I mean, a bigger a bigger issue is how do you how do you determine a free a risk free rate, and from my experience, what companies tend to do is they just take a U.S. 20-year Treasury rate, and they say that is the starting point of the risk-free rate, and that's what generally is the sort of thing that happens in that happens in practice to determine a risk-free rate. So I think a lot of work needs to be done around the risk-free rate, but you know, absent a discussion on the role of measurement of liability, I would not be it. Okay, thank you all for that. Uh, I um, we have um, we have uh, one <laughs> one minute left before uh, I should hand over to uh, to Annalisa. But we will take a few more minutes. But so let me ask the panelists for the concluding round. What are um, what should be done with discounting requirements? to enhance uh, usefulness of financial reporting. I ask you to uh, stick to two minutes each, and we start with Andrea. Yeah, I'm very glad uh, to have quite a consensus on uh, the necessity of having a more comprehensive disclosure uh, around this country rate uh, for all firms all, and all all standards. Um, I think uh, just uh, just to conclude, I think that's the the right way uh, to go in order to to provide a better view to of the real financial state of the company to the investors and the financial analysts. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, um, I agree with Andrea that um, definitely um, on, on discount rates, um, uh, disclosures um, are very important uh, to to um, yeah to describe, um, make obvious the, the the judgment applied, and um, on a on a on a short time basis, I I, I, I would um, like to see some some more guidance in 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 setting. IS-19 discount rates, so to, to reduce kind of the, the broad uh, variety in practice. That would be my point. Um, Thank you, Andre. Alistair. Thanks. Um, just, just very quickly, as I said at the beginning, I don't think things are as bad as, as some might think I don't, uh, and I think if the use of discounting is a is a black box, I think that is that is disappearing with better disclosure. I think another important source of information in the accounts is the auditor's report with the extended uh, audit reporting and the key audit matters. I think you'll find a huge amount of valuable information in the key audit matters disclosures that auditors put in. But at the end of the day. Uh, I don't think discounting is being used opportunistically by companies. In my experience, I think far and away the most, you know, the, the, the majority of companies are trying to do the right thing. Their auditors are trying to do the right thing and to, to achieve, uh, to achieve, um, you know, fair presentation. I think what, what would be helpful or greater clarity in the accounting standards as to what we're actually trying to do with discounting and then greater Disclosure would be a lot more helpful for the for the investor community. Thanks. And Sue, maybe have your views. 
Firstly, thank you for a really interesting discussion and lots of interesting things for me to take away to think about. I think that this really just highlights the importance of discounting decisions in accounting because it's a big deal in terms of the effect on the financial statements. So it's great to have this debate and to have people engaged in the debate. I think my main takeaway is I think everybody would agree, um, even though we've got dis differences of opinion on what the objectives should be, perhaps, and what the input should be, that we should work towards having more clarity on what the measurement objectives are and what the inputs are, so that we've got a common understanding in the standards for what everybody should required to do, and good disclosures to support um, investors' understanding um, of the important, uh, given the importance of the discounting decisions that made, and if I could, just a just a couple of um, comments, just advertising. Sorry, there's quite a lot of noise. Advertising um, a couple of um, relevant consultations at the moment for those interested in discount rates. Firstly, the agenda consultation that we've got out at the moment. There is the potential for a discounting rate project in there. So if you feel strongly on that, uh, be aware of that. Also, we are going to be looking at the own credit uh, question for the discount rate in IES 37, so look out for that. But more um, specifically, at the moment, we've actually got an exposure draft out on disclosure um, amendments at the moment, which propose updating the disclosure requirements in IES 19. So those of you interested in IES 19, pick up the exposure draft and let us know what you think. Um, you've got the live opportunity now, so thank you all. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, the academic participants. Thank you also for the audience that have listened to it. I hand over to Annalisa to close the... No, we have the polling. Sorry, sorry, I see that, uh, Rospis, we have the, the, the last polling. And where are the results for the last, last polls? I don't see it. Okay, so here we are. So, um, are there major issues with discounting in financial reporting that needs to be addressed? And if so, what are the main issues? There are no major issues is 1%. Yes, the discount rate required by all IFRS standards do not result in the most useful information, that is 14%. Yes, it is difficult, costly to comply with the current requirements, 9%. Yes, but the issues are related to application rather than the standards, 12%. Yes, companies do not seem to comply with the current requirements, 6%. Um, yes, there are issues with discounting and provisions in IS 37, 12%. Yes, there are issues with discounting defined benefit pension obligations in IS 19, 12%. Yes, there are issues with discounting when estimating fair value in IFRS 13, 9%. And yes, there are issues with discounting related to insurance, 8%. So um, that was the last poll then. So then I leave over to you, Annalisa. Thanks a lot, Erland. And uh, allow me first of all to thank uh, the organizers and all the speakers, presenters and panelists for the very uh, interesting and insightful debate about uh, something that is very clear now. It's a very relevant issue in financial reporting. I'm sure that I can speak on behalf of the audience saying that we all learned a lot from this discussion, this debate. I'm confident that uh, this will lead to interesting follow-ups. Uh, personally, I leave uh, this meeting with uh, a better awareness of the relevance of uh, this topic and the complexity of discounting in financial reporting, but also with a few relevant takeaways. And I would like to take this chance, you know, these few minutes that I have to summarize some of these uh, takeaways, uh, focusing in particular on possible venues for future research, uh, being me an academic, uh, so I would like in particular to stress how we can contribute to this kind of debate. 
The first takeaway is that discounting is pervasive. It's a pervasive issue in financial reporting. And that's very clear from this debate. Several standards refer to it, and not always in a consistent way. This creates, obviously, some implementation and interpretation concerns. Uh, also, it implies diversity of solutions in practice. And this is uh, both from the choice of discount rate and from the disclosure point of view. This fact by itself highlights that we need further research uh, on the topic. But it is also an opportunity because whenever there is diversity in behaviors, there is room for research. It would be not otherwise. If everyone behaves in one way, that means probably that that's the only way or the best way already. So it's an opportunity to do more research. Now, uh, what we noticed uh, clearly that uh, uh, notwithstanding the pervasiveness of discounting, accounting research is still lagging behind on this uh, topic. Differently from economics and finance, uh, we haven't probably devoted enough attention to this issue so far. And it's about time to do more on this because, uh, as we have heard during the debate today, not always the models that we import from economics and finance are suitable or uh, practicable, practicable to meet uh, uh, accounting information uh, goals. Um, another point is that we have seen uh, very interesting evidence on preparers' behaviors and on their perceptions on this issue. But uh, the feeling is that uh, we don't have yet enough evidence on users' behavior and perceptions in relation to discounting in financial statements. We heard about the possible solution, which I found very interesting, you know, to improve disclosure, to provide information on the cash flows, and also the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, let's say, provocative uh, solution that we leave to users the task to define the proper discount rate uh, all to themselves. But is this an effective solution? Maybe different users have different preferences. Do they really appreciate this type of disclosure? What type of disclosure they, they would like to have? And what about proprietary costs related to such disclosure? Uh, would the preparers be happy with this kind of disclosure? So these are, as you can see, so many questions that are still open and that confirm that uh, it is a very promising venue for future research. We can use uh, archival, we can use uh, especially surveys and experiments to answer these questions. Um, now, financial statement items, this is another point that I would like to highlight, are affected, uh, uh, there are many financial state items that are affected by discounting. And uh, research could help to understand whether one solution fits all or whether we need different solutions. Now, from the discussion, it's clear that uh, there is a sort of convergence towards the idea that we need different rates for different items. It follows that we need additional research on preparers and users applied to specific items that uh, include a discounting factor in, in, in the implementation. And when we talk about users, investors are certainly a major group to be researched, but uh, as a, one of the papers that we, we heard before, the one by Michelon, Pananen and Schneider, there are other stakeholders that might be affected in a way by these kind of uh, issues, like in the decommissioning liabilities. And uh, the idea not to consider only investors, but other key stakeholders is very stimulating for research, especially on those issues where there is a clear interest in understanding financial statement information, like in the one that we have uh, uh, heard before. Now, in conclusion, I would like to, to say a couple of words on uh, the role of accounting research in this type of debates, more in general, not specifically, and not only related to the discounting issue. I think it is evident that accounting uh, research, academic research, can be very helpful in understanding how reality works, what is happening in reality. And we have seen some interesting examples in today's presentation. So we have learned how financial statement uh, preparers behave, what are the problems that they face, how diverse is their approach, and so on and so forth. But, you know, there is another role of research that comes out very clearly from today's discussion, and this is... Uh, uh, a role that the European Accounting Association, like many other academic uh, associations, uh, is trying to promote. And this is the impact of research on practice. Uh, you know, when I teach my PhD students about how accounting research changed over time, I like to highlight that uh, if we go back to the 20th century, to the beginning of the 20th century, accounting research was mainly normative, 
which means that it was aimed at providing and finding the best ways to prepare financial statements. <laughs> For example, what was the best way to measure income, to calculate depreciation, and so on and so forth. In the second part of the 20th century, accounting shifted towards a more descriptive approach to understand reality rather than providing normative indications. Today's discussion, today's debate, I think highlighted very clearly how important it is to recover that normative approach of accounting research especially in those cases where the description of reality shows that the state of the art is far from being ideal. And such normative research may be based both on conceptual and empirical works. So there is really a lot still to be done from this point of view. Events like the one of today, uh, where we put around the table academics, regulators, standard setters, practitioners, uh, users, preparers, auditors, are, I, in my opinion, a great occasion to stimulate impactful research and at a later stage to share and to discuss the results of this research. So I really wish that more events like this will be organized in the future to make accounting research more impactful. And the European Accounting Association will be glad to contribute to such events. So thanks a lot again to organizers, speakers, and participants for such a great and insightful discussion. And I, I wish all the best to all of you.